In this PowerPoint, we're going to discuss what it means to be an ideal gas, as defined by the kinetic molecular theory. There are five basic concepts associated with kinetic molecular theory. Number one, gases are composed of molecules that are in continuous motion, traveling in straight lines and changing direction only when they collide with something. Number two, the molecules are negligibly small compared to the distances between them. Three, the pressure exerted by a gas results from collisions between gas molecules and the walls of its container. Four, gas molecules exert no attractive or repulsive forces on each other or the container walls. And five, the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. These five postulates of the kinetic molecular theory explain all the gas law relationships we see between pressure, volume, temperature, amount, mass, and speed. For example, Guy Lussac's or Amonton's law states that the pressure of a gas in a sealed container with fixed volume is directly proportional to its temperature. And kinetic molecular theory states that the pressure exerted by a gas results from the collisions between gas molecules and the walls of its container, and that the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. So if we heat a container with fixed volume, the gas molecules inside it are going to start moving with more energy. And that means that they're going to hit the walls of the container with greater force. More energy, more force. Now remember that pressure is simply the relationship between force per unit area. So if we keep the interior surface area of the container constant because it's a fixed volume, but we increase the force because we've raised the kinetic energy of those molecules, we will also increase the pressure. So in Guy Lussac's law, the volume remained fixed. But if we were to allow the volume to change inside our container when it was heated, we would find that the volume of the gas would expand. So in this case, the more energetic gas particles would actually push this piston out. The resulting effect on pressure would be that the surface area inside the container would increase to a point that it would balance out the increase in force due to the more energetic particles. And the pressure would remain constant. This is Charles' law. The volume of a gas in a sealed container at constant pressure is directly proportional to its temperature. Our next simple gas law is Boyle's law, and it relates pressure to volume at a fixed temperature. It states that the pressure of a gas in a sealed container at constant temperature is inversely proportional to its volume. So because temperature remains constant, the average kinetic energy and the force of the gas molecule collisions stays relatively constant. But changing volume changes the surface area of the, con of the container. So as we decrease the volume, we'll also decrease the surface area that's available for collisions. And this ultimately will increase the pressure. A smaller denominator results in a greater value for the fraction overall and a greater value for the pressure. Avogadro's law states that the volume of a gas in a sealed container at constant temperature and pressure is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules, N. So if we increase the number of gas molecules at a constant temperature, they'll actually be colliding with the walls of the container more frequently. They'll be colliding with the same amount of energy because it's a constant temperature, but they will be more collisions. And that means that the force inside the container will increase. In order to maintain constant pressure at the same time, then the surface area inside the container must also increase. And that means that the volume of the container increases. This is Avogadro's law. 
the kinetic molecular theory also explains Dalton's law of partial pressures, which states that the total pressure of a mixture of ideal gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the component gases. As kinetic molecular theory states, ideal gases do not interact with each other. And what this means is that at a constant temperature, volume, and amount, they will exert the same pressure on the container if they are individual gases or if they are combined in one container. Finally, the kinetic molecular theory can also explain Graham's law of effusion which states that the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its molar mass. So it turns out that the rate that a gas particle moves, which is essentially the rate of effusion, can be defined relative to the kinetic energy of the particle. And mathematically, the relationship is kinetic energy of a particle equals one half times the mass of the particle in kilograms times the velocity of the particle squared. So when we're dealing with a large number of gas particles, we calculate the average kinetic energy of those gas particles. And that utilizes essentially an average velocity of the particles. And for a large number of gas particles, the best average is actually something called the root mean square velocity. So if you look at a uh, molecular speed distribution for a large number of particles, which is what this graph shows you, what you'll see is that not every particle is moving at the exact same speed. In any population, what you'll find is that some of those particles are actually moving really, really quickly. And some of those particles are moving really, really slowly. The majority of those particles, the greatest fraction of them, are actually moving at an intermediate speed somewhere in between. And that intermediate speed is ultimately determined by the temperature of the particles. Notice that this distribution is not exactly symmetrical. It's got a little bit longer tail here on the higher end. So taking the average of this, the best average, is actually this root mean square. And what that's defined as is the square root of the average of the squares of the velocities of each of those particles. It's just a little bit higher than the uh, peak of our distribution, but it reflects the fact that there's a few more particles here on the higher end um, that have to be reflected in our average. So we use the root mean square velocity in our calculation of average kinetic energy. Now we also know from the kinetic molecular theory that the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. And this can be expressed mathematically as well. Average kinetic energy of those gas molecules is equal to three halves times R, which is the ideal gas constant, times temperature in units of Kelvin. You'll notice that the form of the ideal gas constant that we're using is a little bit different. This is because the units have been converted. Um, so we've gone through dimensional analysis to convert our units of liters times atmospheres over moles to units of joules. So instead of 0 0.08206, we're going to use 8.314 joules per Kelvin. We can set these two equations equal to each other because they're both equal to average kinetic energy. And now we can solve for our average velocity, our URMS. And if we rearrange the equations to do that, we come up with this. Our average velocity, or root mean square velocity, is equal to the square root of 3 times the ideal gas constant times temperature in Kelvin divided by the mass of the particles. And the mass of the particles is ultimately represented by the molar mass of those particles. And so this fits with our understanding of Graham's law of effusion, which states that the rate of effusion, which is essentially the velocity that those particles are moving, is inversely proportional to the square root of molar mass.
So temperature was also a part of that equation. It was in the numerator, which means that we have a direct relationship between the temperature of a gas and the average molecular velocity. We can see that in this velocity distribution chart for nitrogen gas. So one gas, one molar mass, that remains constant throughout. The main variable here is in the temperature, and we start with low temperatures of 100 Kelvin associated with this highest peak curve, and we see that that highest peak is actually occurring with the lowest velocities. So lower temperatures, lower velocities. We increase the temperature, the peak starts shifting to the right to higher velocities. We get a larger spread of uh, different velocities so that the curve is ultimately more spread out, but they are spread more towards that higher end. So higher temperatures, higher velocities on average. If we keep temperature constant, however, then molecular velocity will be solely dependent upon the molar mass of the gas, how large that particle is. And so this molecular velocity distribution is for one temperature, but several different gases. Xenon is our heaviest. And you can see that the heaviest gas has the lowest velocity distribution. Our, in general, our average velocity is much lower than it is for helium, which is our lightest gas. And here we have a much larger spread of velocity distribution with the average velocity occurring um, at a much higher rate than it does for any of the other gases. So molecular velocity is directly proportional to temperature and inversely proportional to the mass of the particle. In summary, ideal gases conform to the kinetic molecular theory. And that means they're composed of molecules that are in continuous motion, traveling in straight lines and changing direction only when they collide with something. The molecules are negligibly small compared to the distances between them. The pressure exerted by a gas results from collisions between gas molecules in the walls of its container. And gas molecules exert no attractive or repulsive forces on each other or the container walls. The average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature of the gas. So if any one of these postulates does not hold true, then the gas is no longer behaving ideally. And that will be the subject of our next PowerPoint.